Uh, Let's grab our Bibles and let's turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. Revelation, chapter 2. And for an opportunity to earn a gift card, what was the church that we talked about? Now, it doesn't say his name specifically here in Scripture. We're going to talk about another martyr uh, this morning as we continue. And uh, But we already mentioned this martyr before. Uh, this martyr was the church of before he was martyred. And it's a church that we mentioned in the last couple of weeks, at least a couple of different times. Um, His name was Polycarp. What church was he the pastor of? A minute, Brother Jay, I'm running. All right. If you know, think you know, want to give it a shot, what church was he the pastor of? Is that what I said? Polycarp, yeah. What did you say? Brother Jay? Yeah. Did you say that, Steve? Right there, but Um, how was Polycarp, I'm just going to, you just got to tell us, how was Polycarp, how was he killed? What was the method, I guess? I'm not trying to be gruesome and morbid here, but, um, I mean, this is real, this is real Bible Christian history right here. Um, or Dave? I think you're the only Dave in here. I, well, I, you looked like you wanted to answer, but I don't, I'm not giving a gift card away to this one. Go ahead. No, I believe he's burned at the stake. Burned at the stake. Burned at the stake for not recanting his faith in Christ. And so we've, uh, we are uh, studying here these seven uh, churches, these letters to the seven churches in, in the book of Revelation. Of course, Revelation is a, a prophetic book. Um, there is prophecy in this book. It, it, it is prophetic, but at the same time, yes, these, uh, these things happened as well. And um, so we are, we are gleaning, though, and we understand that there are different churches uh, throughout history, throughout ages and ages to come. And these were churches that were, and uh, we are learning from them as uh, far as some of their strengths some of their weaknesses, uh, the human pen that God used uh, to pen this uh, book of the Bible under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And then the main book of the Bible, I just want to continue in our study from last week. I just got into the first point. Um, but John is the human pen, yes, and then in particular, this church at Pergamus is what we're going to look at next. This is the third church there, and of course, this is what we're going to look at. But you go on a map in your Bible there, that's the church. Some of these are in there, depending on what uh, what maps you might have in the Bible there. Uh, but yeah, if you'll look in, uh, uh, it's map number 11 in the back of my Bible, if that helps. Um, what modern country are these churches that we are studying in? What modern country, for the McGraw? Yes, modern day Turkey. And so, not a lot of current event that takes that's taking place or that has taken place and will continue to take place in modern day Turkey. So as we Look, if you've got a map in the back of your Bible there, like I do, <clears throat> you'll see there is, uh, there's Greece, there's Macedonia, I'm sorry, Greece, Macedonia, Achaia, and then you get to the uh, north of Israel, north of um, Syria, 
you will find in kind of uh, up over peninsula-like, you'll find the uh, country of Turkey. And then to the, uh, to the east of that, I'm sorry, to the west of that, you will see the majority of these churches that are we make, that we are making mention of here uh, this morning. Now, what's the big deal? Well, because this is in the Bible. Uh, this is God's Word. And so as we study these churches here, we see some fascinating information, I believe, but we see some uh, just wonderful doctrine. And uh, what are churches supposed to believe? Uh, what are some of the strengths of, of uh, these churches? What are some of the weaknesses of these churches? And we ought to be learning. What kind of church do we do? We want to practice the weaknesses that some of these churches practice? No. We want to learn not to do that. Uh, and we want to learn their strengths, and we want to we want to strengthen ourselves. And so, um, number three here uh, this uh, this this morning, these seven churches in the book of Revelation. Number three, church number three that we look at is this church of uh, Pergamos. In your Bible, in your map, it may say Pergamum. But it starts off here, in the, in the map section anyway, but um, this church of Pergamus. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse number 12. Verse number 12. We'll begin reading here in just a moment, but let me give you a little bit of introduction that I think will be helpful for you, um, especially if you missed last week. And this goes, it helps, it helps to maybe uh, solidify or paint a, get a, a frame around the picture here of this study. These letters are what Revelation purports them to be. They are letters to seven churches of Asia Minor. Um, and they are written at the end of the first century. These were literal churches with literal pastors and literal church members in literal cities. Literally, they are, uh, it's highly probable that John, the apostle who God used to write, uh, pen this book of the Bible, it is quite possible that John knew all of these pastors personally. He certainly knows one of them that we uh, mention here uh, later on in, as we read this here. But um, let's see, John would have looked upon them as, these pastors here would have looked upon John as somewhat of a father figure and a spiritual leader in the faith, kind of a discipler, disciple uh, type of uh, um, relationship. And by the way, we still have that in this day. We, we are to disciple. God wants us to be disciples and make disciples. And that is a command that none of us can, can escape or get around. That is a command that God has given each, each one of us. Um, and if you have children, I dare to say that um, if you're saved, born again, child of God, that it's your responsibility to be a discipler of your children as disciples. But then also, there are, uh, in the spiritual realm as well, we are to make disciples. We're to share the gospel with people um, and encourage them to trust Christ as Savior. And then we're to encourage them and teach them to observe all things. We're to teach them Bible doctrine. And so that is a relationship that John had with many of these pastors that we're reading about. Polycarp was one of those. Polycarp was burned at the stake. Polycarp was the pastor of the church of Smyrna that we read about several weeks back. Okay, let me read this here. Um, these letters here serve as a written template. They are scripture. They show successive generations of how Jesus sees and speaks to local churches. It may be that a number of churches might share certain tendencies and similar traits in given time periods, but this is only generally true as far as uh, from absolute. All seven of the churches that John addresses existed at the exact same time in history, within a few hundred years or so. Uh, and they were in relatively close geographic uh, proximity. Even today, you could have one congregation in a city that is strict in certain doctrine, but may be loose or, or uh, lenient in another uh, doctrine. For example, uh, the church of Ephesus, uh, they were strict in doctrine, 
but they were not very loving. If you remember from the very first uh, study of this church of uh, Ephesus, man, they dotted all their the I's and crossed all the T's, and, and uh, they, they probably were straight on in the fundamentals of the faith, but uh, according to the Bible, they had, they, had, uh, they, had, uh, uh, they had lost their first love. Uh, first love meaning Jesus. They had, they had gotten away from the heart of it, and they were focused on the rules. And um, is my understanding there. And so uh, just an example of how churches can be. Uh, while another congregation in the same town is asleep and dormant like Sardis. You ever been to a, a dead church? Please don't say I'm in one now. <laughs> a dead church where, man, it's just they're just going through the motions. They're just being religious, going through, and you people don't have a personal relationship with the Lord. Nothing excites them. They don't, they don't have a, they don't have that uh, the working of the Spirit of God. Or man, there's no personal, uh, it seems like there's no personal aspect of a relationship with God uh, there. But, uh, and so that uh, describes somewhat the church of uh, Sardis. And yet another congregation is smug and prideful like the church of Laodicea. And so it's unwise to attempt to paint all churches. How many have ever met somebody that said, oh, I tried church? Might have tried a church, but I got news. You know, there's, there are many different uh, churches in a variety of ways that are not so good differently, but there are some that are, uh, you know, right on and good. And so we ought to strive to be a perfect church according uh, to the eyes of God. Amen? Um, in the first century, just like today, local congregations differed from each other. They did not all conform to whatever stereotypes may have existed for other churches in that particular age. The congregation in Corinth was full of infighting, full of carnality. There was a, there was a fleshly sin going on in the church of Corinth. Uh, some stuff you'd be like, really? Oh my goodness, uh, that is disgusting. Uh, then there's the Philippian church. The Philippian church was very gracious. Man, they were missions-minded. They were giving to missions and missionaries, so they preached the gospel in different regions of the world, but also they were very poor. They were uh, financially, they didn't have a lot of money in the church of Philippi, but God called them very liberal in their giving. How did they do that? They did that through the power and spirit of God. Each church had its own strengths and weaknesses. In its early days, believers in Ephesus were prolific in evangelism. They were prolific in church planting. But we hear nothing along those lines of the churches of Galatia. Now, I'm almost done. When, when people say the early church, these are the early churches. The only church that you can get that's any earlier than this would be uh, Jesus and the Twelve. First church. What is a church? A called out assembly of born again baptized believers that are gathered together, that are assembled to fulfill the Great Commission. And uh, I got one more card here. For an opportunity to win this last card here, where did the very first church, well, they, they, they probably assembled other places, but one place in particular, where were they, where did they, where were they known uh, to have met that, man, you can't argue with it. What is a meeting place that they met? Where's their, where's their meeting place that the Bible specifically mentions? They were meeting there. Who didn't raise their hand? Oh. The upper room. Where were you getting, is that what you're going to say, Brother McGraw? All right, I'll give you the card instead of Steve. Just kidding. He's cleaning up. Yeah, the upper room. They were meeting in the upper room. One of the reasons they were meeting in the upper room was for fear of the Jews, the religious people out there. And, uh, man, they, they believed in Christ, yeah, but their Messiah had died, and uh, he had risen, and they're meeting in the upper room, and Jesus comes into the upper room, and uh, they're like, Messiah, he's alive. God breathed on them the Spirit, uh, Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. That's a criteria 
uh, for being a uh, for being a church, uh, somebody that's got the Holy Spirit in them, the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, same same title, uh, same different different uh, same person, different name. Okay, all right. Now let's read in our scriptures here, Revelation two, beginning in verse number twelve. Oh man, I'm over, I got to hurry here. And unto the angel of the church in Pergamos write these things, saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, whom taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat the things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent. Now, repentance is a, is a normal practice, should be a normal practice in a Christian's life. What is repentance? When we understand we're doing wrong and we change our, it's an inward change in the heart and mind, okay? God has revealed to me that I'm, I'm not doing right. And so I'm going to turn from that and turn and acknowledge what God says is right. Okay, so God says repent or else I'll come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Let's pray and ask God for help. God, would you help me? I feel our time is fleeting, and there's so much that, uh, so so much truth within your word here. Lord, may we glean, uh, Holy Spirit, would you work in our hearts and help us? Help us to receive the message, the messages within Scripture here this morning. Lord, empty me of self and fill, fill me with uh, your spirit, God, I pray and ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Pergamus was a beautiful city that was situated uh, upon of a, a, a high mountainous region. Brother Bobby, can you put that on there? And, um, thank you, sorry about that. Just to give you a visual here, probably many of you have even seen this picture before. Uh, but in a different, uh, maybe at a different angle. Uh, but to give you an idea that this uh, this city uh, was situated on a hill, huge mountain, uh, very majestically looking over a beautiful valley. You could see the Mediterranean Sea uh, from it. And uh, Pergamus was one of the cultural and religious centers of the world. It had been the capital city for some 400 years of this uh, region. Uh, temple after temple, worship area after worship area was built upon this uh, region, and they weren't all good. As a matter of fact, one uh, well-known uh, little G-O-D god uh, that uh, had this as his uh, worship temple, uh, his name was Zeus, or the, the mystical figure uh, where he uh, was uh, known to have been was here was Zeus. Its library was second only to Alexandria, Egypt. It's the most prominent city, and it featured this citadel-like structure, this fortified building that rose about a thousand uh, feet in the midst of the city. There was a temple to Asclepius. And uh, probably many are familiar with this symbol that was used at this temple. It was uh, kind of like the rod or a staff. It was a serpent that was wrapped around a staff, and the temple was famous for its college of medical priests. But the most famous pagan altar was built to Zeus in this area. It was an overpowering site. It was built upon a huge ledge that jutted out and towered above the city. It was the largest most ornate, and most famous altar in the world. Jesus reminds this church of Pergamos 
this church at Pergamos. He writes this letter to them, and in this letter, he gives them some commendation. He gives them some rebuke. He gives them some instruction, and we're going to try to glean from it all here this morning. As we examine these insights in this text here, I want us to consider this church at Pergamos, and I've entitled it a compromising commitment. In this church here, we see compromise. We see compromise. Now, I have no more cards to ask you, but I want to I want, I want the juices to be flowing here, and I want you to consider this. What does it mean to compromise? What does it mean to compromise? Anybody have a concise definition? Is compromise good or bad? It can be good and bad. Definition of compromise. Let me give it to you here. Um, it Absolutely can mean that, and that it can be to not hold fast the truth. Yeah, it can absolutely mean that, and that would be a negative uh, compromise. Let me give you a little story in our house. I got four boys, and uh, they're, every day it seems like they want to eat more, okay? And they're, they're ne- especially if something's good, it's funny, our youngest said, um, I'm hungry, but um, I don't like the, the food that you made is yucky or something to, 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 to mom, uh, to my wife. Uh, anyway, they, uh, they eat more and more and more and more, and uh, sometimes there's not enough for everybody for seconds. And I think in particular, you know, we, were, we went out, Uncle Carl took us not too long ago out to uh, Steak and Shake. And by the way, they got like $4 meals there. It's not the way that it used to be. I hate ordering from the kiosk, and I don't like that you don't have the waiters come, and they don't have the pepper water at the table anymore, but the food is still good. Uncle Carl took us there, and um, but I don't know that they had to do it this time, but there was an extra cheeseburger after they had already finished their cheeseburger, and if there's an extra sandwich and they're still hungry, one of the things that we've come up with to help compromise uh, the situation is, okay, somebody, we got a, we got a nice cheeseburger right here. Everybody's going to go to Steak and Shake after lunch, after church, right? There's a cheeseburger here, okay, and uh, two of the kids want it. How do we divvy that up? Well, one gets to cut it, the other gets first pick. And so that cutter, you better believe he's, he's going to cut as uh, even as he possibly can uh, in order to make a compromise so each gets an equal amount. Well, that compromise can be good. But when it comes to compromising the truth of God's word, there ought not be any compromise when it comes to Christianity on foundational truth. If the word of God says it, we can't compromise. We believe in salvation by grace through faith. That not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is detrimental and can be deadly when compromise comes uh, to a church. And we see that compromise had infiltrated this church here, this church of Pergamos. And so we're going to study here. I'm going to give you the first point. Last week I went through the first point, and that's as far as I got. But we're going to see, number one, we're going to see the position of this church. The position of this church. Jesus says in verse number 13, I know thy works. I know thy works. And, by the way, God knows the works of us, the Life Point Baptist Church. And he knows what we're doing. He knows our motives behind what we're doing. He knows why we do what we do. And... We ought to do what we do because we love the Lord and out of appreciation for what He's done for us. Why do I want to tell people about Jesus? Because it's going to earn me my ticket to heaven? No, I want to tell people about Jesus because it's such a blessing to know I've received that truth. I know that I'm on my way to heaven when I die because somebody shared the gospel with me and I can't help but want to share with others. I want the world to know. We want the world to know that truth. And so we see the position of the church. Jesus says, I know thy works. Then we see their dwelling. We see the dwelling of this church. Consider this 
And um, consider this here. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. I know I mentioned this point last week, and we considered it a little bit, but Pergamus was in a hostile environment. They worshiped in a city, the Bible says, where Satan dwelleth. As I was studying this morning, man, I was considering that. I don't know that the Bible says there's any other place where that hints or mentions where Satan dwells. I know that he's going to be eventually cast into the lake of fire. The Bible does say that. I know there will be a millennial reign uh, that uh, we will rule and reign with Jesus here on this earth for a thousand years. And I believe Satan is bound in, uh, he's bound for that period of time. But the Bible specifically says here, the city where Satan dwelleth. And we don't, uh, we, we kind of, um, it doesn't always sink into us because we don't see him. But we certainly see the effects of Satan in our lives, right? We certainly see the effects of Satan in our society and in our world today. Temptation and, and why do people do what they do? Because, man, this is a sin-cursed world. Uh, I'm reminded once again, man, why do people behave the way they do? People behave unsaved because a lot of people are unsaved. And even saved people sometimes behave unsaved. But the Bible says here, I want you to consider this. I'm not dogmatic about this. I'm not saying this is where Satan lived at this time. But I don't see any reason why it couldn't be. The city where Satan dwelleth. You got to think if maybe somebody with the power and influence that Satan has over the world. The Bible calls him the prince and power of the air. Uh, the Bible talks about in the book of Job that the Lord had a uh, conversation with Satan and uh, Satan was walking around seeking, uh, looking to and fro. Uh, the Bible says Satan walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so I think it's a significant statement. I believe the word of God literally. And so perhaps if the Bible's saying, God's saying, this is where Satan dwelleth, perhaps he lived in that region of the world. And if he lived in that region of the world, and certainly he's influenced the entire world negatively, I could just imagine perhaps how wicked that region of the world could be. You know, there's a place in the United States where uh, people, if you said Sin City, where do you think? Vegas, right? Just uh, That's a nickname for it. And certainly sin goes on, and certain sins go on in that region of the world. Let me say this, though. But sin goes on in every region of the world, and it will never be perfect until we're raptured. And it won't even be perfect after that. Never be perfect, and there will be no perfect person until we are raptured to be with our Lord and Savior. And so I'm simply trying to uh, see here, we see the position of this church. We see their dwelling. This church was in a very wicked region of the world. We see their doctrine in verse number 13. And thou holdest fast my name. God commends them here somewhat. He said, yes, you hold fast my name. He does give them some recognition. Uh, you hold fast my name in the, in the midst of the evil uh, uh, area that they lived in. And, um, and that's good. He says in verse number 13, And hast not denied my faith, not only his name, they held fast uh, to their faith. Uh, I believe that to be some foundational doctrine. They believed that Jesus was Savior. They believed that he shed his blood. They believed in the, the, uh, the blood atonement of Jesus. So this church held fast to that faith. They held fast to his name. Um, there are others, and I had planned on asking you, what are some of these fundamentals of our Christian faith? But uh, for sake of time, we're not going to do that. Then Jesus mentions here, he mentions their devotion. Even in these days here, uh, wherein Antipas, look at verse number 13, was my faithful martyr 
who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. And we talked about this last week, and uh, Jesus speaks of this man Antipas. Antipas was the, the pastor of this church of Pergamos. And Antipas, the Bible says here, died a martyr's death. He was faithful to the death, believing, and I, I feel like sometimes we, we just, we don't relate to this type of uh, Christianity. None of us have been persecuted to the extent where you know, we gotta, we're facing death because of we need to, uh, if we don't recant Jesus. This is how Antipas died. He was a faithful martyr. History tells us that Antipas was the pastor at Pergamos, and his name means against all. That's going to be the name of our next boy, hun. Antipas. Man, that's, that's awesome, isn't it? He stood against all that Satan brought, and he paid a great price. He refused to acknowledge Caesar as a god, and he was placed in a, a brass bull, and fire was built underneath it, and Antipas was roasted alive for the faith. This church of Pergamos, we see the position, their dwelling, their doctrine, their devotion. But then we see, number two, we see the problems within the church, the problems within this church. And uh, I think this is probably some of the main point here that uh, we can glean from. The problems within this church, every church has got problems. But one of the problems that this church had was their compromise. Look at verse number 14, verse number 14, but I have a few things against thee because thou hast them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now, I don't understand, I don't comprehend how God commends them for holding fast the faith, uh, holding fast uh, the faith, holding fast his name. And now it, it, it could be this, there, there are those, and there are those in every church probably that hold fast to truth, but there are also those that can come into a church and not know and compromise and hold different doctrines, different teaching. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. The faithful were doing the works of Christ, but there were some among them who were not. The church was mixing, this church was mixing with those who taught some false doctrines. And as a church, we don't compromise our stand. We don't compromise, once again, our foundational doctrines of, uh, of the Word of God. And in favor of uh, attendance, in favor of being well-pleasing to the crowd. You know, by, the, by the way, we can, we can still hold doctrine and be sweet people. We can hold to the truths of God's Word and take a stand and be strong. And uh, be tender, compassionate, strong people. And that's what God desires in His church. There can be a whatever-it-takes mindset where standards and doctrines are lowered and cast out for the sake of cooperation and perceived growth. Uh, how many understand that unbelievers don't always receive Bible doctrine. Um, even believers don't always understand or perceive. Uh, it's funny. Um, we were at the meeting yesterday and uh, with, uh, with Brother King, and he made a great statement how, you know, when people get saved, we're all at different, uh, uh, God wants to save everybody. God wants everybody to come to a saving knowledge of himself, by the way. You haven't done anything too bad. You've not... Uh, You've not uh, done anything too terrible to be saved. You've not been anywhere too terrible to be saved. God wants you saved. God wants you to acknowledge your sin, put your faith and trust in uh, Jesus Christ. And, uh, and I remember when I got saved, all I knew, I knew that I was a sinner. I knew that Jesus died on the cross to save me from my sin. And I knew that I needed to receive Christ as my Savior. And I did so. And when I got saved, I felt like a ton of bricks was lifted off my shoulder. 
the, the, the debt, the consequence of that sin had been lifted, that my load had been lifted. Man, but I didn't know fundamental doctrines of the faith. That was the start. That was when growth needed to start. I was a babe in Christ. I was a newborn creature. I was, a, I was spiritually born again. I was a babe in Christ. And from there, I needed to grow. Brother uh, King said, man, when I got saved, I didn't know the difference between the Virgin Mary and Aunt Jemima. How many are there? You can relate to that. You didn't know the, the blood atonement, perhaps. You didn't know the, the substitutionary uh, you know, sacrifice that, that Jesus made. You didn't know uh, sanctification and maybe not even regeneration. You didn't know all those all those Bible words are big, you know, scholarly words, but you knew that you got saved. You knew that you were forgiven of your sin. And so a compromising church will soon be filled with lost people who have a false sense of security and no genuine conversion. A church isn't just a gathering. It is a, an assembly of born-again, baptized believers that are assembled to fulfill the Great Commission. And so there were some that had compromised, and as a result of the compromise, there was corruption. There was corruption. Look at verse number 14 and 15. He says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Corruption follows compromise. It won't be long until the ways of God are left for the ways of man. Jesus warns them of this doctrine of Balaam. And just to summarize it here, in the book of Numbers, there was a man, there was a uh, man, there was uh, Balak, he was the king of Moab. Balak had hired a religious person. Okay, let me put it in those terms. King Balak of Moab had hired Balaam to curse Israel. Balaam's curse was turned into blessing. When his plan failed, Balaam got Balak to uh, corrupt Israel by enticing them to engage in idolatry and immorality. And Israel believed they could live as they pleased and still have favor with God. Let me tell you what that is. That's religion. I believe we live in a religious world. People believe certain things, but it doesn't always come from the Bible. And, man, I know a multitude of people, and there are a multitude of people, groups, that, uh, yeah, they, they believe in Jesus. He's another, he's another, uh, he's another little G-O-D along with their other gods as well. And so... Um, you know, we can't have it both ways. There is one way, and Jesus is the way, thankfully. And I thank God that I've received him, and, and praise the Lord if you've uh, received him. He is the way, uh, the truth, and the life. There is an additional ways of, of salvation. And so uh, Jesus speaks of this corruption that was taking place within this church. He said, you have, uh, uh, the, the, you're a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols. You Follow the doctrine of Balaam. You follow the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. He says that in verse number 15. What was that? The doctrine of the Nicolaitans. We mentioned that, I believe, within the first church we saw, uh, Church of Ephesus, how there was a hierarchy in different positions and different uh, titles within uh, this church. How many know, uh, what, are the, what are the two offices within a scriptural church? Two offices. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 every, those whoever said that, uh, okay. Pastor, deacon, uh, pastor, elder, bishop. Three uh, synonymous for pastor. Maybe different scopes of responsibility. Okay. Pastor, deacon. Those are two offices mentioned in scripture uh, for a, for New Testament church. Um, we don't have priests that we go to any longer as Old Testament. The Bible says, as a matter of fact, that 
We are priests. When we get saved, we become priests. Uh, we can go directly to God. We don't have to have a, well, Jesus is our mediator. We go to God the Father through Jesus Christ. He is our access uh, to, to God. We don't have to, I don't have to go and tell somebody else. And, and how many are thankful for that? Um, I'm happy to, to counsel uh, from the Bible, uh, give biblical counseling, and I want to continue to do that. I'm happy to pray for different circumstances and situations. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to come to me or any other man and confess sin unless you've wronged that person. And, am I confusing you terribly? If, uh, man, if I've done you wrong and uh, I realize I've done you wrong, yes, I should come and confess my sin. I'm sorry what I did to you. But as far as uh, sin between you and God, you go directly to God for that. And so there was this doctrine of the Nicolaitans. They were teaching this hierarchy within uh, th this church there. Different, I don't know exactly what the titles were, what the hierarchy system was, uh, but the hierarchy system, according to the Bible, is we believe in a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. These three are one. Manifest God manifests himself in, in uh, different ways, time periods here through Scripture. But there was a corruption. I've got to hurry here. There was a corruption in this church. There was the compromise in this church. And then there was their confrontation. Jesus said, because of this, because of your corruption, because of your compromise, Jesus says in verse number 16, repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Jesus gives a solemn warning to this church of Pergamos. He says, repent. Again, change your ways. Turn from that sin. Turn from the wickedness. Turn from the sin that you're, you're, you're exercising there. And turn back and see things the way that I want you to see them. He says, if you don't, he'd bring consequences. Unresolved, Jesus would bring swift judgment to this church at Pergamos for their compromise and their refusal to confront the error in the church. We see that Jesus committed to fighting error. He's committed to fighting false doctrine in his churches. And we need to understand there's, there are times that we need to stand. We need to stand for Bible doctrine. So, Jesus speaks of the position of this church. Jesus speaks of the problems within this church. And then lastly, we're done, the provision for the church. In verse number 17, he says this, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh I will, uh, will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. Let me encourage you here this morning, church. We've seen the, uh, we've seen the position. We've seen where this church was located. Uh, we've seen, yes, uh, their, uh, their, their corruption and their compromise. And God in his merciful grace, he says, man, repent, turn. And he's given them opportunity. And he says, yeah, if you do so, you get right. Hey, when we get right with God, he blesses. God doesn't bless unrighteousness. God doesn't uh, reward unrighteousness. And uh, now I believe he's uh, showing here some of this, uh, uh, some of this, uh, some of his goodness, some of his blessing. Yeah, you trust me as Savior. Now I don't, I don't, I don't. Uh, 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 I don't. Uh, oh man, I can't think of the word that I want to say. I don't. I don't claim. Uh, to understand everything within the last portion of this verse right here, okay? But I, I, I do have some stuff that I think will be helpful to, uh, uh, for it to make a little more sense here. The faithful are never forgotten of God. Amen to that. 
And uh, it is required in a steward that a man be found faithful. And by the way, aren't you glad that it doesn't take any special gifts or skills? It's not a, a, a spiritual gift to be faithful. Everybody has the ability to be faithful. Particularly, um, there's the ability to receive Christ as Savior. And I believe uh, the, 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 the blessing, part of the blessing of receiving Christ as Savior, here comes some of this description we're going to talk about right here. Those that have received Christ as Savior, and then you're faithful to go through uh, any persecution. How many uh, realize Antipas, man, he's not suffering in hell right now. One that was burned in the, in, roasted in the, in the bronze bull, he's not in hell. According to the Word of God, he's in heaven. He's with the Savior. He says this, three promises that Jesus gives here. Number one is the hidden manna, the hidden manna. Now, if you're not familiar, back in Old Testament, God led the Israelites out of Egypt. They were in bondage and slavery for some 700 years. God raised up Moses to lead them out of that bondage, out of slavery, and uh, eventually to the promised land is, is where they were on their way to. While they were in the wilderness, God fed the Israelites with manna, angel's food. God fed them, and God miraculously brought this bread down from heaven, and that's how they ate. God was their provision. By the way, God is our provision today. Uh, but hidden manna. And so <clears throat> most in Pergamos, were, they, they filled themselves with worldly pleasures. But those that were faithful and overcame Jesus would, uh, Jesus would uh, feed them with his abundance. And this manna is food, sustenance. And a sustenance that only God can give. Satan rapes and pillages and destroys and takes, but Jesus offers provision and even bounty. What Jesus offers is always superior to what the world offers. And as we feast on what the Lord provides, we find nourishment for our souls. And so Jesus, uh, he makes mention here, he that overcometh, uh, I will give to eat of the hidden man. I don't understand why it's hidden. I don't understand a lot of it right here. But God says, I'll give you manna. And I will give him a white stone. Now, what's the big deal about that? What's not like a marble, you know, play games or something? What is the idea with the white stone? Learned a little bit. And it may seem of little value to us today, but... It was a precious gift in that day. White stones were given by judges to those who were found innocent. Soldiers would receive them after a victory in battle. Kind of a, you know, I've got the, got the victory here. Um, and so, you know, when you get saved, you got victory. They were broken and shared by friends to be used at a time of need. They were given as tickets to special occasions. A groom would offer a white stone as a promise uh, to take his bride. How many ladies in here are thankful we don't do that anymore? You get like a diamond usually now, right? Um, or something of that nature. A groom would offer them. Today, uh, those that are saved have this white stone to their account. So if you've been stay saved, you say, I don't have a white stone. I don't know where it's located. Okay, I don't know. In heaven, you've got a white stone. From, from what I understand, if you're saved. And then he continues, thirdly, we see here, a new name, a new name. The white stone given to overcomers would have a new name written on it that no one knew except the recipient. And this speaks of our individual relationship with our Savior. How many are thankful for that? I was thinking it was of a sad thing at the same time we we're I think I was talking to you about it Krista we were talking about you know we're not was I talking to you we're not married when we get to heaven and uh, I think we'll still hang out together right and uh, <laughs> I still think we'll uh, I'll love you and and stuff but isn't that weird to think about I don't know why what I brought that up for, but um, 
a new name. When I think of it, I think of how God changed the names of his people in the Old Testament oftentimes. Even in the New Testament, I think of where were a couple names that were changed. Jacob was changed to Israel. Jacob from deceiver to Israel. I forget what Israel means. What? That was Jacob. Israel. Peace? Okay. So we got a new name. I think of Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah, Saul to what? Paul. I wonder if they're going to be just slightly changed from what they already are. I don't know if that's a pattern, right? But um, I believe that's a connotation from our old nature, our old being and who we were in the flesh to our new creation in Christ. And so we get a new name, a white stone with a new name. I'm no longer the man that I used to be since I've been saved. Jesus has given me a new name, and now I belong to him. And, and that new name is recorded in the Lamb's a book of life, never to be removed. And every child of God shares an intimate relationship with a loving, heavenly uh, Father and, and Savior. Our names are different, but he knows us all. I've been challenged by the text here, and there's a strong push in our day to abandon sound doctrine. And he'll just come, man, that, uh, that church, they got some great worship. What do they mean by that typically? Well, music. That's, that's fine. I think, believe music can be part of worship, certainly. But uh, is, there, is there proper Bible doctrine? Is there... Love and grace shown and is the great commission being shared and perpetuated to a lost and dying world. And we can sing praise to God all that we want. We come in here and, and man, we can have a, a uh, top-notch choir and music groups and musicians and things of that nature and we can sing such great praise to God. But are we sharing the message of God, the gospel, to a lost and dying world? Serving the Lord and standing for Him will probably bring opposition in our future. We need to be determined to stand for Jesus. If we compromise our stand and allow corruption into His church, We're in danger of rebuke and judgment. And he's done so much for us. The least we can do is abide faithful to him. I want to ask you this morning, is God speaking to your heart in some capacity? Maybe you're in here this morning and you didn't realize, man, Pastor Sam, God's speaking to my heart about doctrine. What does doctrine mean? Doctrine is simply a teaching. Teaching. What do you believe about Bible doctrine? Do you know the, the, do you know foundational Bible doctrine? We never arrive, by the way. Uh, we're, we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Has God spoken to you? Is there a need that you have right now? Why don't you tell our Savior? Are you committed to serving and living for our God in a culture that sees no need for truth or Christ? Maybe here this morning and you're yet unsaved. You don't know for sure that if you died that heaven would be your home. And I want to urge you, come to Christ. Today's the day of salvation. Get it settled. We could show you. One of our men in here, if you're a man, one of, uh, one of our ladies in here, if you're a lady, can show you from God's word how you can be certain that you'll spend eternity in heaven according to God's word. Let's bow. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you, Lord, for your long suffering. I thank you for being a gracious heavenly father. You're not... <clears throat> You're not up in heaven, you know, just uh, 
looking down, looking for a reason to, uh, to, to, to correct us because we've done wrong. No, you desire to grow us. You desire for us to grow in our personal relationships, our walk with you. How would you help us this morning? Would you minister to our hearts? Uh, would you help us to be resolved to live for you? Resolved to know what we believe, why we believe what we believe. And uh, would you help us to be resolved to share the gospel with others? With heads bowed and eyes closed and nobody looking around, I just want to ask a few questions. In a moment, we'll have the piano play and we'll begin what we call our invitation. And if God has spoken to your heart in some capacity, now is an opportunity and to, to, to call out to him, to pray to him. You can do it in the privacy of your seat. You can do what some might do as they come up to uh, the front here where these steps are and take a knee and pray to God. Uh, maybe, maybe God has worked on your heart and, and uh, you are, you, you say, Pastor Sam, I was 95% certain that I'd go to heaven, but there's still a 5% doubt that I have. But God wants you to be certain. God says we can know that we have eternal life. And so I want to ask a few questions this morning. How many here say, Pastor Sam, I do know that eternity will be my home and that I'll see Christ in heaven someday. I have received Jesus as my Savior. There was a time when I called on the Lord and I asked Him to save me. Would you slip your hand up if that's you? I have been saved. I have asked Christ to be my Savior. You may put your hands down. Many hands were up. I don't know that every hand was up. But I want to give an opportunity if you... You don't have that certainty from God's word. I'd love to pray for you. I'd love to pray for you to get it settled. Is there somebody here this morning that I could pray for you that you'd get that you would you would get your eternity settled? You know that you'll spend eternity in heaven. Could I pray for you? Would you slip your hand up so that I could pray for you? Anybody at all? Slip your hand up there. You put your hands down. Anybody else? Anybody else? Let me pray for you. Let me see this. My, I'll pray for you. My prayer won't save you. Only a uh, receiving the payment of Jesus Christ can, can take you to heaven. And I pray you'd, you'd do that if, you, if you've never done that. Maybe you're here this morning and God spoke in your heart about doctrine or about loving, about loving in, enough to, to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. Maybe you've got lost loved ones or relatives that uh, need to be saved. And I'd love to help you. We can, we can give you material, gospel tracts. We can, we can help you uh, to, uh, to do that and pray with you that God would give you wisdom in how to do so, help educate you in how to share the gospel perhaps. Let's all stand. With heads bowed and eyes closed, the piano will play. As the piano plays, why don't you take a moment and let's call out to the Lord. Why don't you thank Him for His goodness? Why don't you thank Him?